and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But they that were wise, they that were wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil. Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wide answered and said, not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But you go and to them and set those that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, hear the words, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. They that were ready went in, and the door was shut. Here's my door on the board right here. It's amazing, isn't it? I was, I was told how amazing it actually is. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, watch, be watchers, church of God. Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour where the Son of Man comes. I don't know about you, but I've read this story before, John. I've read it over and over again. But this last time that I read it, can I talk to you like family? <laughs> this last time that I read it, it was so sobering. Because, and I'm going to break it down for you, and I just had to check my heart. I literally sat there and I said, Lord, is this me? Which virgin am I? Which one am I? In leadership, in position, in ministry, you know we can make our ministry a God. What we do for God, a God, rather than loving on God. I remember when I first got saved, it was so sweet. Like just seeking him was sweet. Worshiping him was sweet. It was always sweet. And sometimes when you live for the Lord a little while, you just get used to going to church and doing the right thing and all the going through the motions of your our religi religiosity, so to say, right? And while I'm right with God, I know the message of the cross. I but are we applying every day what we know? And are we wanting more time with him? Listen, mama, if we got to get up at 5 in the morning, guess what? We got to get up at 5 in the morning because we got to get ready. Ready for the day, ready to live for God, ready to know him, ready to, to be a light to our family. Daddy, if you got to stay up late and pray over your household, then that's what we got to do. You get what I'm saying? Because this told me, Naya, this scared me. Because this told me they were all virgins, meaning they were all at one time born again. They were all at one time, it says they were likened to the kingdom of God. That means they were a part, Micah, of the kingdom of God. All of them. And before I get ahead of myself, what I came to talk about is are we ready and being continually prepared? And that word, ready, I like this. It's a fitness word, y'all. <laughs> it meant, are we fit for the kingdom of God when he comes back? 
Are we going to be found continually seeking him? It doesn't say, are we going to be found doing right or singing on the worship team or preaching behind the pulpit? Listen, if somebody never does a job in ministry and it's just a grandma who's teaching their grandkids how to live for God and who's been seeking him, guess what? She's more likely to go to the kingdom of God than the one that is just doing. That's scary, y'all. I mean, I was very sobered by this passage this time. Because I had to really say, God, am I just wanting to know you for you still? Or am I just going through it? Seeking a word of God for my Sunday school class. Seeking a word of God for the next sermon. You can seek a word but not seek God. Does that make sense? And one of the things Naya and I, look, I know that the book of Revelations can be torn apart in all these different ways. And we talk about the end times, right? And we have a lot of debates about pre-trib, mid-trib, all those different things. And that's fine because the Lord says to expositor the word and, and break it apart and seek him, right? But one of the things that Naya and I continuously come back to, because we'll, ta- we'll talk about it and debate about it and try to figure it out. And I know you sat under Pastor Matt who had broke it on down and tried to fi- we're trying to figure it all out. And we have all these people trying to read the signs of the times and this and that and try to figure out when he's coming back and when this is going to line up with that. And that's fine. That's okay. That's right to do. But let me tell you something. In the church house, we come to a place where we debate about what's going to happen at the end, and we miss the mark because we're not getting ready. And I say to Naya all the time, I'm like, I don't know when he's going to come back. I don't know if it's going to be pre-trib or mid-trib or uh, or later on. I don't know. But I know one thing. I want to be ready when he comes. I want the church to be ready. I want my children to be ready. I want my husband to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be found with oil in my lamp. I don't want to be one of the ones that run and say, look, that could be a, we, that could be a friend of ours. They were hanging out, y'all. They were in the church together. And one ran to the other and said, can you, can you give me your oil? That, I was just like, oh, my gosh, Lord, help us. Help us. Help us. Help us not get stuck in foolish debates. And I'm not saying debating isn't good because my husband is the king of debating. He's good at it, too. I told him he should be a politician. Uh, uh, Oh, wait, we need righteous politicians. We need righteous men and women in the government, okay? But when we allow the foolish debate to override the power of God, we've got a problem. I probably err more on the side of I don't want to debate at all, (laughs) which could not be good too. (laughs) You know, you got to find a balance in it. But don't throw your pearls to swine. If it's God, it's God, and he'll give you the words to speak because that's what he said. Micah, he said, open your mouth, and I'll fill it up, right? And the power of God will begin to move. So anyway, we go back to Matthew 24. The chapter before Matthew 25, the chapter right before they, that Jesus says, they that were ready went in. The chapter before says this. It it was preparing the people to let them know, look, this is what's going to happen at the end. He was letting the disciples know, this is what's going to happen. Be ready, be watchful, be vigilant. Be on guard, be smart, be wise, open up your eyeballs. Can I say that? I think we can get so passive as a church because we kind of are in our own little bubble. And, 
And I, I actually can be at fault for this. My husband always got to tell me what's going on in the news. And now, if you watch too much of the news, you can get way too caught up in it. But I'm always asking him, what's going on? And he'll tell me little tidbits, and I said, that's enough. <laughs> that's all I need to know. <laughs> We're still going in the same direction. <laughs> Jesus is still on his way. <laughs> So am I doing my job to get ready and to get the people that are in my sphere of influence? Mama, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, people, you're on the job. Are we letting them know, hey, we got to get ready, y'all. And you got to go out and get your own oil. Elijah, baby, you got to get your own oil. One day when Jesus comes back, you can't look to your mama and say, mom, let me get some oil. And I, I bet as a mama, I'd be like, I'll give you all the oil I can. But we can't. I can't run to Rob and say, Rob, I know your oil is overflowing, bro. Can I get some of yours? He, he, he can't. It's an individual relationship. You've got to get your own oil, right, John? You've got to get your own relationship with Jesus. That oil represents the Holy Spirit working in your life. You got to go get it for yourself. So Jesus prepared them. Haley, if you go to John 16, 13, I want to say this. The Bible says this. How be it when the spirit of truth is come, that's the Holy Spirit, he will what? Guide you into what? All truth. And he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that means hear from the Father, that he will speak. And he will show. Let me, let me break down this word show. He will announce in detail. He will report and declare to you, you disciple of God, you child of God, you born again believer, he will tell you in detail and report and declare it to you, Christian, the things to come. Now, are we being diligent to, enough to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us? He will prepare us. That word prepare means to make someone ready or, be, or the fact that you'll be able to deal with something, listen, to put you in the proper state of mind. Ooh, this up here, y'all. This right here. You got to fight <laughs> the good fight of faith, and it starts when with our thought process, what we think, the way we think about the world, the way we think about the word of God, the way we think about the character of God, the way we think about the church of God, the way that we think. He said, I will put you in the proper state of mind so when these things take place, you will be able to handle them. Let me tell you, my husband and I, we talk about this often. If him and I got married or the Lord brought us together any sooner than we did, we wouldn't have been ready, neither of us. God had to teach us some things because marriage is hard, y'all. Glory. Good, but hard. And you got to know how to touch heaven. And you got to know how to hear God. Because the way Billy Sue down the street and, and Mary Jo handle their marriage ain't, might not be the way God wants you to handle yours. The way that, that church family handles their children, maybe God is telling you to do something different. You don't know. you got to seek God for yourself. He's got to put you in the proper state of mind. Listen, our mind is twisted. The Bible said evil continually. Oh, no, not me. Yeah, you. You and your children. So we got to do what as parents? Lead them in the proper state of mind. 
They need to see our stinking thinking is lined up. Okay, and then when it's not, we need to go back and tell them, hey, (laughs) had it wrong, Cameron, had it wrong, girl, but I'm going to get it right. We, as a unit, are going to get it right, right, Robert? How about in the church house? Can Pastor Matt ever come to you and say, I had it wrong, y'all, and us not crucify him? Come on, we want to hang the pastor out to dry in a moment's notice, but they are human, we are human. We're human, right? But can we say, okay, let's get it right then. Let let the Lord prepare us as a people in the proper state of mind. Because he was saying, look, these things are coming. What things? Well, let's see. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 2. Haley, if you'll go there. Matthew 24, 2 says, and Jesus said unto them, see. All right, I want y'all to look at that word. See, have spiritual eyes to see. You not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be one left, a stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. Right here, Jesus is foretelling the destruction of the temple, which happened in 70 A.D., Well, what does that have to do with me, Angela? What it has to do with is he was proclaiming to his disciples that he was going to die on the cross. That there was going to be the destruction of the temple. So why does that mean anything to me? Because he was giving his disciples insight. And he was telling them what was going to happen. Listen, I'm going to die on Calvary and I need you to be ready. And we were telling the kids this recently. They said, he said, Ezra said, well, what happened to the disciples when Jesus died on the cross? I wonder how they felt. And Jeff said they were scattered. When something hard happens in our life, do we scatter? Come on now. I know, look, fight or flight (laughs) is usually, are we going to fight the good fight of faith or are we? Or we could fight another way, too. Come on, we're going to fight in our flesh at times, too. But also, or are we going to run away? It's too much. I didn't expect this. Listen, when I got saved, I'll tell you this. I did not expect anything. <laughs> I don't know what I thought, Hannah. I guess I just thought me and Jesus were going to be in the clouds, like. You know what I mean? But all of a sudden... It hits the fan, and we're like, whoa, I didn't expect this. But he said, you were going to have trouble in this world, but I will give you peace. That's getting some oil. That's a part of getting oil. I'm going through something, but I'm going to run to the master because he has peace for me. I'm going through something, but I'm going to run to the master because he has victory for me. I'm going through something, but I'm going to run the master because he's got healing for me. I'm going through something. I'm going through it, but I know that he can restore my marriage. I know that he can restore my finances. I know that he could do what he said he would. That's getting oil. That's trust in him. That's believe in him, despite what we see or look at. Because look, could you imagine being with the master all that time, him healing, raising the dead, coming against the Pharisees, flipping tables, doing all these miracles, and all of a sudden, John, he's on the cross, being and bloody. I mean, Come on, that's how, that's how we do. We're saved, glory of God's moving, and all of a sudden we walk outside and a disaster happens, and what? The sheep are scattered. Right? I mean, I, I could be the first ones to say, I've been there. But God, help me. Help me not run. Help me stand firm. Help my faith to stand fast. Because, look, he came at an hour which nobody knew, and there was no oil in five of their lamps. God help us. And that, look, we don't know how long the time was. God, don't let my oil go out. Okay. Then he says this. Matthew 24, 3 says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciple came unto him privately, saying, Tell us. When shall these things be? 
And what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? So the signs, they were asking, what are the signs of the end of the age? Can I say this, that it's okay to ask God questions? Have you ever met somebody before that like really feels like, or maybe it was you, who really feels like they can't ask God questions because then they feel like that's doubt and unbelief? It's okay. He's your father. I don't feel like if I ever went to my dad and asked him a question because I didn't understand something, that he'd be like, Angela, you should know that by now. Right? Would you do that, sir? If your daughter came to you, if Cameron came to you, and she was like, I don't know how to fix this on the car. That's something she has no idea what to do, right, Cameron? But, but you do. And you don't discourage her. Say, come on, let me show you. Right? Because he's a good father. And sometimes he don't give us all the details because we, he wants us to continue to believe. Continue to trust him. I'll tell you why. I probably walk to the car with my dad and be sitting there for five minutes, watch him start doing it, and be like, yep, he got it. I'm going to. You know what I mean? That's how we should be with the father. He begins to explain something to us, show him something to us, and be like, yeah, my dad got it. He got it. Sabrina, he's got it. He's got it. He's working it all out because he's good. But Getting oil would be trusting him through the process of it all. It's okay to ask your father questions. So he begins to tell them about his second coming. So that question right there, tell us about the signs of the times of the end of the world. That's telling me that they had to have some type of understanding that he was going to disappear at some point and then come back. Some type of understanding, probably didn't know it to its fullness. Let me ask you this. The Bible says this. I'm just going to give you scripture about asking the Lord questions. Matthew 7, 7 says this. Ask. That means ask, beg, call, crave, desire. Ask with intention. Ask with expectation. When I go to my dad and ask him a question, I expect him to know the answer. And if he don't know the answer, I'm sure he'll try to figure it out. But when we go to the Father, we ask with intention, ask with expectation. Hannah, he's going to do it. Because he said, what? Ask and it shall be given, granted, committed, had power to you, his child, his disciple. Seek. So this is a progression. You're asking. You don't see it yet. Seek. Endeavor. Inquire. Trust, believe, have faith continually. Seek and you shall what? Find. That means you're going to see it. You're going to obtain it if you don't quit. This is getting oil, y'all. Asking. Seeking. And then it says what? All right, it didn't happen yet, Robert. I'm a knock. Hello, Lord, I'm here. <laughs> I'm being dramatic, but come on, that's how we got to be sometimes. That persistent widow, she didn't quit. That unjust judge, he was unjust. But she, it said she, she wearied him continually until he was like, just, okay. <laughs> and now that's not the hot heart of our father. But if we keep coming, he's going to show you. Because that shows what? Faith. And it's impossible to please him without faith. And it said, it shall be open unto you. Now, Jesus did say this. He said, look, I'm going to tell you about the signs of the ends of the times. But uh, Matthew 24, 4 says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Pam, that tells me, as a believer, Jesus was saying, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise, and I'm going to ascend. Then you will see signs of the end of the times. And I'm going to tell you what they are. But be ready, Manuel, because take heed, they're coming to deceive my people. What does that word deceive mean? 
means to roam away from safety, to go astray, to error, to be seduced, to wander off or out of the way. Can anybody say that there are times when we face things that we err more on the side of running away from safety than running to? I don't know why our flesh is just prone to wander. It, it, the Bible says that, that our heart is prone to wander, prone to leave the God that I love. And you could literally sit here and say, well, that's not me. Okay, Peter. Peter said, I'll never leave you, Lord. And I don't know, in the next verse, he's like, I don't know him. God, what you, what you doing to him? I don't know him. How many times have we got our back in a hard place and we're like, I don't know him. Really? But you know what's so beautiful about the Lord is right now in this word, he's saying, I want to get you ready. And if this is you, just come back. Just come back. It's that simple. Just come back. Because there's those that are coming to deceive you. And he, I'm preparing you now. And why does he prepare us? He prepares us because he doesn't want us to be led away from the truth. The Bible says, Matthew 24, 5, For many shall come in my name and say, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. He said, this is going to happen. Someone's going to come and say, I'm the Christ, and what's going to happen? It says, shall deceive many. Who's it going to deceive? The elect. His people. He don't need to go after those that don't know him already. They're already deceived. <laughs> they don't know the truth. It's our job to bring the truth. But the thing is, is so somebody that is deceived has to be already on the right way. That's you and me. So get ready. Know your word. Hear what God is saying. Get your oil for yourself. I can't ride off Naya's oil, even though she got great oil. I'll never forget this one time. Um, the story was told. A great evangelist was preaching, and this guy comes up and says, I want your anointing. And the guy says, you don't want my anointing. And he said, no, I do. And he said, okay, come here. And he lays hands on him, and he begins to pray, and he begins to pray that he gets struck by lightning and all this crazy stuff that has happened to him. And the guy says, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I will stop praying that. And he said, well, you said you wanted my anointing. You want my anointing, you got to go through what I've been through. And he's like, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good, right? You got to get your own oil. You got to get your own relationship. You got to do it on your own. You got to run to the master on your own. Listen. Some, some in this church house right here could be deceived, could, could walk away and be deceived in this time that he's talking about. We've got to know him for ourselves. Because say, and God forbid anybody ever did, but say half the church decided, well, we're going to follow this. So he says he's the Christ. And the other half is like, no. Mm -mm. Well, you got to stand on your own. What if my husband was the one to say, how hard would that be? Well, I'm just giving examples, y'all. We all, we all going in, okay? That's what I'm saying. We all going in, but he's getting us prepared. And it says, Matthew 24, 6, does this sound familiar? And you shall hear of wars. Anyone? Rumors of wars. You shall see trouble for all these things must. Uh-oh. Must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Ooh, Sabrina. We're going to see wars, rumors of wars, trouble on every side. But Jesus is saying, John, the end is not yet, though. Oh, so we're going to see some things, Christian. Okay. 
For the nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilence. Do have we been singing it? Earthquakes in diverse places, and these are the beginning. I don't know. This whole thing hit me differently, Micah, this time through. Beginning of sorrows, the beginning of pain and suffering. But he that endure till the end shall be saved. Endure. How are you going to endure if we don't have oil? If we don't have the power of the Holy Ghost living in us, through us, continuously, we're not going to make it, y'all. But it says endure. That's a verb. That's an action word. That means your faith is continually moving you forward. Endure means to stay under. Angela, you don't even know. I don't want to stay under this. It's just too heavy. Remain under. Why? It's producing fortitude with your faith. That means I'm suffering something difficult and unpleasant, but my faith is moving me forward because it says those who remain under till the end shall be saved. Well, this isn't a frilly message for a Sunday morning. But God is preparing his people to get ready. Look, we can try to figure out what the red horse means and the white horse means. And all these different things that I think are awesome when we pull them apart. and Because it does say in the book of Revelations, who reads this book shall be blessed. And we could try to figure that all out and feel real good about ourselves. But this right here is what we need. Those who endure till the end shall be saved. What does James say? James 1, 2 says this, my brethren, count it all joy. Y'all ever fall on a trial and be like, yes, yes, trial again, Sabrina. No. We're like, why, Lord, why me? Really, human nature, right? But he said, count it, reckon it all joy. When you fall into, fall into diverse, various kinds of tests and adversity. Count it joy. Knowing this with complete assurance and confidence that the trying, testing. Look at this though. That word trying means testing of your trustworthiness. The Lord is testing our faith. Are we going to stay true to him? Because look, he didn't lie. He didn't lie to us. He didn't try to deceive us. He literally is telling us what's going to happen. But come on, we, I guess sometimes we feel like, well, it's not going to happen. We don't see it all. And in America here, we don't get really hit with a lot of I mean, over there we see in Israel all those different things taking place. But you, our home hasn't been touched with that yet. But what about when it is? I mean, I don't think we can quite fathom it yet. We got hit with COVID, and you know how that felt. Some of us had people that passed. We know how that felt. But Jesus is saying in the end it's going to be worse than that. Are we going to be ready? Well, when, when we come face to face with this testing, are we going to count it all joy? It says, for the, your faith worketh patience. What? My faith. Not your skill, your ability, not the law, not what you do. Your faith. Works patience. That word patience means a constant endurance, a remaining under, the ability to withstand hardship. You ever have somebody that gets on your nerves real bad and you're like, oh, God, help me to be patient with this person. Help me to be patient. That means, I'm making it funny, but that means that I am enduring hardship. 
chip of them in my space, right? And I am enduring with them. I'm showing them the love of God. Sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. God help us. Because our pay, why would we do that anyway? Because normally, if we, if we were just moving by the flesh, we'd be like, get out of my space. Or you're annoying. Or you would see them on the other side of the church and be like, be line this way. Y'all know we do that, right? Don't act like you come in here and then you don't see some, you see somebody and you're like, yeah, I'm getting out of there. But your faith will push you towards them. Let me be kind to them today. Let me be long-suffering with them today. Because why? My faith is working. My faith is working patience. You know, you know why I come up here and lay hands on people to pray? Why? Because my faith is working. My, I'm believing, God, you're going to touch them. You're, does your, is your faith working? You know, if we believe something, we're going to do it. If you believe when you walk across the street and you see that 18-wheeler coming and you see it, you're not going to what? Walk across the street till it passes, right? Because you believe that if you walk in the street, you'll get hit by it. If you believe something, you, we're going to see evidence of what you believe. Is the oil working in you where I see evidence, where we see evidence, where you see evidence of what you believe? Help us. I know we, it, this, this message hurt me, but in a good way. Because he, gave, he gives us an out. And it says, let patience have her perfect work, that you may be what? Perfect. Y'all, this doesn't mean perfection as in I got everything together and I'm perfect. This means I am mature and growing in moral character and my mental state. Think about that. Ask yourself, am I growing? Do I have earmarks of growth, growth in my life? Or am I stagnant? And listen, it's okay to be honest with yourself. Please be honest with yourself. Because there's been times in my walk with the Lord where I've had to literally be like, I'm stuck. <laughs> Naya, I'm stuck. Something, something, something's off. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just going through it. And sometimes we get into that place with not even realizing it. Right? I'm just going through it. And then God's got to shake us a little bit. A little shaking. <laughs> Wake us up. Sabrina said it this morning. He was calling to the church. Wake up. Wake up. The signs of the times are coming. It's the beginning of sorrows. Get ready. I'm coming back. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. I'm maturing you in your moral character and your mental state and your faith that you would be entire. That means entirely sound up here, right here. I'm sound. You ever meet somebody that's like going this, this way, this way, this way. I serve the Lord, I don't. Serve the Lord, I don't. So, ooh, we do the dance, little on the line dance, gray area dance. Come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Listen, I can wake up one morning and be like, I'm done, God. I'm done. Yeah, you understand, Yvette? Right? God doesn't want us to do the fence dance. That's a wave tossed to and fro. Unstable in all of our ways. Listen, I'm not condemning, but if our children look at that, what do they have to stand on? Repent. Today. I need to. Repent. Today. I literally said to myself when I was going through all this, God, I feel like I've been caught in the, in the swing of ministry. I want to be caught up with him again. You, there's a difference. There's a, there's a, there's a church in ease that we live in. I know all the lingo. I know all the books of the Bible. I can recite them and get the kids to. I, I've been coming to church for the last 14 years, every Wednesday, every Sunday, every time the door 
doors are open. Can y'all re relate? You know what I'm saying? Listen, we can do all those. I pay my tithes, pay my tithes every month. Don't miss. But I'm missing him. Martha said it. She said, Lord, I am cumbered by all this serving. I'm troubled by all this serving. Get Mary. Tell her to help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are troubled. You are anxious with all these things. But Mary has the best part. She's got the good part. And he said, that will not be taken from her. And what did that mean? That word good meant beneficial. It was beneficial for you. I'm telling you, I feel like that at times. As a dad, you're providing for the home and you're doing all these things. As a mom, you're taking care of everything that's else going on in your business. Naya, you're growing a business and, you're, and we're doing and we're trying and we just got to live. We got to live, Mike. We still got to live, right? We got to take care of all these things. And come on, we can get so busy, so busy and anxious about so many things. And Jesus is saying, Hold on. Just stop for a moment, for a minute, for a second. Sit with me. I'm speaking. I want to I wanna encourage you in everything you got to handle today. Right? That's getting oil. I want to lift up your spirit today. Sit with me. Come on. Those who are weary, those who are thirsty. I have the water, of, and look, we can get so caught up with the church, the act of church. Listen, Jesus doesn't want you to just come in here and lift your hands on Wednesday and Sunday, and that be it. That's not it, y'all. If that's what we're doing, get it right. Let me tell you something. That Bible, that Bible is a everyday sword because you are in a everyday war. Let me say that again. The Bible, the word of God is a everyday sword. Because why? You are in a everyday war. I know you just ate eating. I know I say eating funny. From New Jersey. Eating on Wednesday and Sunday. I know y'all eating three meals a day. Four, five snacks, drinks. You did not, you probably ate breakfast this morning, right? So you're just not eating. Rob, do you only eat on Wednesdays and Sundays? I can say that to Rob because I love Rob. He likes to eat. Why as the church of God are we only eating the word of God on Wednesdays and Sundays? Maybe sometimes just Wednesdays or sometimes just Sundays because I got to work. Tell your boss you went off on Sunday and Wednesdays. Why? Because I want to gather with the body of Christ. I want to hear the word of God. I want to worship with the body. I want to see God move in everybody's life. I'm getting oil, Jess, every day. Fresh oil. Fresh manna. Every day. You ain't. I said this before, but it still applies. I'm not going to go into the refrigerator three weeks later and go eat the old spaghetti. It's going to have mold on it. I'm not eating that. Would you eat that? So why are you living off a message from three weeks ago? Why are we not getting fresh oil every day? And if you eat three-week-old spaghetti, that's between you and Jesus. Bless your digestive system. <laughs> but it says, the word of God says, for there shall rise false Christ, false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders. Listen, those who are false, you're going to see signs and wonders. That's kind of scary because we're going to be like, ooh. You ever go to the fireworks? You know, everybody says, ooh, ah. Ooh, ah, well, that's how we're going to be in the church. Ooh. You ever watch 
walk by a diamond counter, I do this. And you see the little, gl the little um, glimmer on the diamond, and you're like, ooh. I'm like, Jeff, let's go see how much it is. <laughs> That's how we're going to be, though. As the body of Christ, we're going to see these false prophets doing all these signs and wonders, a little glimmer in the air, and be like, ooh. You better know the Holy Ghost and the Word of God so when it happens, he can remind you of this particular verse. Right, John? He says, if you get the Word inside your heart, the Holy Spirit will bring it back to remembrance. What if you never sat under this Word right now and you never read it in the Bible because we don't open the Bible for ourselves because we're getting no oil? Then what? And if you can't read the Bible, listen to it. Just get it, however you can get it. I don't care how you get it, get it. If you need somebody to read it to you, ask your spouse. Read me. My, my husband is the king of this. I wish he was in here right now. He reads the Bible for himself, y'all. But in the morning particularly, he's not a morning person. So he'll literally, I, I wake up like, hey. So he'll read the Bible at night, and I'm asleep. But I wake up in the morning, and Naya knows this. I'm the queen of getting a word in the morning and wanting to tell everybody about it. I'm like, look what the Lord showed me. And this, and in the morning, I'll, I'll, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. He's like, babe, just read it. Just read it. <laughs> and then I read it, and I'm like, are you there? Are you listening? <laughs> it's good. And he'll listen, and he'll, I'm like, what I just say? <laughs> and he'll repeat it to me or whatever, or not repeat it to me. <laughs> and then I'll be like, all right, you ready to pray? Yeah, and he'll pray. And then I'll really know if he was listening because he'll pray whether or not uh, what I just read or not. <laughs> but while I'm saying that, I'm making it light, but however you can get it, get it. Okay? There's going to be times I need him to read to me. Get it. There's times me and I break out and open the word of God on the phone. Get it. Okay? If you need to listen to anointed sermon while you're driving on your trip to wherever you're going, get it. Listen to anointed worship. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to tell you what to listen to, but you need to be listening to anointed worship. That's between you and Jesus and your oil. Because there's music out there that will drain your oil. So I just want to say that. Listen to worship. Listen to things that's going to encourage your spirit and encourage you in the way you want to go. That's between you and Jesus. But let me tell you something. If we're not prepared to worship through the storm, I don't know if we'll make it. I might have to be singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little Look. Sometimes I don't know all them fancy worship songs that they all know. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's my, that's Selah's, one of her favorite songs. Why? Because that was one of the only ones I knew how to sing over her. And she'd go to sleep. Right? But you're going to need some of that to get through these, these times. Wait. That's some truth right there. Jesus loves me. This I know when you're feeling unlovable and unworthy. Oh. Look, I'm not, for the Bible tells me so. I'm getting oil, y'all. Y'all can make fun of me if you want to. But let me tell you something. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. Where you belong to him. Not to the deceiver, not to the enemy, not to this world. Why? Because the Bible says you were bought with a price and you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your life is not your own. Oh, now it's, it, it's hitting home. Pam, did you know you're not your own? You're not your own. You're not your own. You are not your own. You are not, can I say that? You are not your own. Get over it. Listen, Naya's mother, I love her to death. I'm so glad I sat under her for so long. 
But I'd be like, I don't want to go and minister to those people. They hurt my feelings. She said, you know what? You put your feelings on the back burner and you go out there because your life is not your own. It's not about you. Ooh, and that would hit, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go. They're so mean. I would, we were in a ministry with our women and children that just came off the street and drugs and jail, and it was pretty raw, y'all. But she'd go, you have a message that you need to give them, and you need to care about their souls more than you care about your own emotions. I feel like I want to tell people that sometimes, but sometimes that's too hard for the church. We so soft. You get what I'm saying? Listen, I'm not saying I haven't had church hurt and I haven't gone through some things. And I have been through some things. But guess what? My life is not my own. And I need to care about the souls of people more than I care about my own emotions. And more than I care about myself. Put yourself on the back burner. Hannah, put us ourselves on the back burner as mothers because it's about the children's souls. Put yourself on the back burner. It's about the soul. When you go into work... Listen, you know how many times I didn't want to work at that job, this job, that job, whatever job it was? God, I don't want to go one more day. You have no idea what this is like. He knows exactly what it's like. Why do we always think Jesus is up there like with his eyes closed? And then all of a sudden he opens up, oh, I didn't know that's what they were going through. He knows exactly what you're going through. He's creating something in you. He's putting oil in you. Oil is the Holy Ghost. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, that's the oil press. Pressing oil. Jesus got to the point where he was sweating drops of blood, and he said, Father, take this cup from me. And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Oil, right there. When you say, not my will, but thy will be done, oil in your lamp. Jesus said, they will deceive the elect. Behold, I have told you before. Getting you ready, church of God. Anybody in here, I thought about this. Anybody in here like a fake Dooney and Burke coach, Michael Kors bag, fake now nah, you want the genuine article, right? Yeah. I, I mean, look, some of us maybe only can afford the fake, and we'll get it. But if we could afford the real, we want the what? Genuine article. Well, there's markers to look. When you look at a, my mom's good at that. She'll know. She could tell uh, as soon as you walk in the door, that's fake. <laughs> I'm not saying she does that, but she'd be able to tell. She has what? A good eye for those type of things. That's what the Lord was telling us to do. He's saying, look, the signs of the times will be this. The genuine article, Jesus Christ, will come back. He's coming. But there's going to be a fake first that's going to deceive. And are you going to be able to tell, church of God, which is the fake and which is the real? You better be well versed in the earmarks of what the genuine article looks like versus what the fake does. So that we're what? Not deceived. Not deceived. I will say this. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Matthew 24, 36 says this. No one knows the hour. Come on, y'all. I just, I got to say this. So many times we fight in the church trying to figure out the hour. For real. And, and you know what happens with the lost? They look at us like we're foolish because we're fighting amongst ourselves. Can we stop? Can we stop fighting amongst ourselves? He says no one is going to know the hour. I'm not saying don't study that and don't try to put the, uh, please don't take it that way. But when that supersedes the power of God and the love of God and brings division in the church, that's never what God intended it to do, ever. 
He wanted to prepare his people, so he told them what it was going to look like in the end. But he never wanted us to be at each other's throats about it. He's going to present it to us. He's not going to choke us with it. I'll, I'll never, Jeff always tries to get his kids to eat new foods. And I think that's right. He wants to culture them. But sometimes they just don't want to eat it. And he'll be like, just take one bite. One bite. Right? And he'll get them to eat it and they'll be like, Bleh. Right? We don't need to do that to each other, y'all. We don't need to force each other. Just present it and leave it. I'm talking about you a lot, Jeff. You're missing it. Present it and leave it. But you know how hard it is for a Christian to do that? Because we want them to get it. And we want them to see it our way. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about? I, w I want you to see it this way. This is how God showed me. You got to get it because God showed me that. Okay. Well, guess what? God didn't show me that. And my job is to present it. And your job is to eat. And if you don't eat, that's up between you and the Lord. But it's not my job to make you eat. Get what I'm saying? So let's do that too with people. We try to force feed people. We try to get them to see. Oh, even our spouses. We found that a lot. I, Jeff, you've got to see it the way I see it. <laughs> And then two years later, he'll be like, guess what the Lord showed me? And I'll be like, I told you that two years ago. But see, I shouldn't even respond that way either because that's not how the Lord would respond. Or he'll come to me and I'll be like, oh, the Lord showed me this. He's like, Angela, I already told you that. But look, we can't force feed people. Our job is to present it and leave it. Spouses, children, people you work with, church folk. Well, they've been in the church 15 years. They should get it already. Why are you trying to choke them with your oil? Let them get their own oil. But they're not getting oil. What, you the oil judge? You get what I'm saying? Come on, I'm making it funny, but that's really what we do. That's, real, that's really what we do in the church. And we'll hang someone out to dry real quick. But look, the Bible says this, Matthew 24, 36. So we're going to stop arguing here because, listen, this is what it says. But of the day and the hour knoweth no man. Glory. We don't know when he's coming. Not the angels of heaven, but who? Only my father knows when he's coming back. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of the, that were the flood, they were what? Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day of Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the Son of Man be. What is this telling me? That there were those that weren't in the ark, that weren't ready, that weren't prepared, and it was too late. The ark of the covenant, the door was what? Shut. And they couldn't get in. They weren't ready. They were distracted with everything else. Listen, the Bible isn't telling you don't eat, don't drink what is right. Don't marry, don't live. That's not what the Bible is telling you. The Bible is telling you you're going to do all those things, but you've got to be ready and know and be sober and be vigilant and be expecting and be a watchman. Are you watching? And that doesn't mean walk around all paranoid. Jesus is coming. Don't do that. Ready. Prepared. Situation comes up. God, help me. Lord, restore me. God, let me see what your word says about this. Pastor Matt says this. I don't agree with it. Let me see what your word says. Get your own oil. 
Yeah. Get your own worship life. Can you worship without the worship team? All the worship team says, uh oh. <laughs> Can you worship without the worship team? But I can't sing. I don't care. The Lord says, make a joyful noise. Sing unto me with gladness. He did not say you had to be able to know how to sing. Now, my husband probably feels like Angela, psh, bring it down. And I'm like, glory, glory. <laughs> but you know what? I don't care. Because I'm going to make a joyful noise to my God. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has. Sometimes you got to go back. Take inventory. What has he already done? Because he's going to do it again. What has he already done? Get oil there. Get oil there. What has he already done? Because he's going to do it again. What has he already done? Get ready. Don't be shut up. Don't, don't let the door shut and you're standing on the outside saying, I'm supposed to be in there. God help us. Genesis 6.11 says this, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Does that sound like today? Corrupt and filled with violence. Oh, and God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for the flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So God told Noah to build an ark. Are you building yours? I'm building an ark, y'all, for my family. That the children, when they come, one of Jeff and my prayer for our household all the time is God let them know the presence of God continuously. God, when people walk in our home, now we're not perfect, y'all, but when people walk in our home, let them feel the presence of God. If they've never encountered the presence of God before, let them feel it when they walk in our home. Let our home be a house of prayer. Let it be a, a refuge for the hurting and the broken, for our children to know what the presence, listen, they got it. Chase, is it hard at school? Can it be hard at school? Oh, can it be hard at school? <laughs> it can be hard at school? Yes, it can be hard to be a believer as a child where at school. Can it be hard at work? Can it be hard with family? Can it be hard with friends that you thought were your friends that ain't your friends no more? Can it be hard? Let your house be a haven. Let Peace reign in your home. How? Get it oil. Listen, life is hard enough. You better protect your home. You hear what I'm saying? If you are a single mom, if you, whatever, wherever you live, that right there is your haven. Douse it in prayer. I don't know how to pray. Grab the Bible and begin to pray the word of God. I don't know how to worship. Turn on a worship song. Put the words on the, on the TV and begin to sing to the Lord. I don't know how to read the word of God. Just open it. Read it. It speaks. It does. I promise. All of a sudden, it's going to jump off the page and you're going to be like, whoa. The Holy Ghost is reading my mail. And maybe it will say, tell you, Angela, be quiet, submissive to your husband. <laughs> no, really, though. I'm making it funny, but I'm telling you, the Lord will speak, and that's me getting oil. You get what I'm saying? But look, I can't run to Sabrina's house and ask for her oil when Jesus comes back. She's been getting her own oil in her own home and creating her own ark. I can come over, Roberts, and help him build a little bit his ark. You like my hammer skills? How were those hammering skills? They were good? Okay. <laughs> I would like a nail gun. <laughs> right? But I can't get his oil. We can help each other, encourage each other. 
Man, Naya tilled this ground the other day. It was beautiful. But I can't go over there and till. I wasn't there to till her ground with her. No, she legitly tilled ground, like, for real, like, in a garden. It looked great. But she had to do that for herself. She did that for herself. You got to do it for yourself. And we got to show our children how to get their own oil. Listen, our children, they... <laughs> When they come to an age where they're, they're accountable for themselves, they better have their own oil. And we better be teaching them how to get their own oil. And I tell you what, I don't ever want to stand before God and him tell me, Angela, you didn't teach them children how to get their own oil. That scares me. I don't want to stand before him and him tell me that. Then we all on the outside of the door talking about, Lord, Lord, let us in. God help us. And then shall the kingdom of God be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamp and went forth to meet the bridegroom. The kingdom of heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever what? Believes and trusts their whole being to him shall not perish but have what? Everlasting life. God's heart was always that the whole, because wait, because I want to say this, because I feel like sometimes we're like, man, how could God leave anybody out? Like how, how harsh? Free will. Listen to what I'm saying. God's heart was always, y'all all right right now? I know we might need to do a little exercise God's heart was always that he gave his what? Only son. That what? Whoever. You hear what I'm saying? He always wanted you, 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 you. Always wanted y'all with him. He wants the whole what? World with him. He's not trying to shut the door and leave everybody, anybody out. That's not the heart of God. He's not a harsh taskmaster. He's not like, I'm going to leave them. I, look, I know a doctrine that says, you're chosen, you're chosen, you're chosen, you're chosen. You're not, you're not, you're not. Oh, Jesus, please help us. That's not the heart of God. He didn't choose you, 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 and you, and then said, y'all go to hell. That's not the heart of God. He doesn't do that. He said, I'm going to give my son that all who believe shall be saved. Oh, so what? There were 10 virgins. Virgin to me, pure, holy, right? So that means what? They were all what? 10 of them born again, justified, legally declared right with God. Immediately what? Sanctified separated, holy unto what? God. That's what we are. Soon as you give your heart to the Lord, justified, legally declared right with God, sanctified, set apart for a different purpose, pure, holy, righteous with God. Why? Based on his blood and blood alone. Right? So they were all what, Micah? Part of the kingdom of God. So you are sitting next to somebody that's what? Part of the kingdom of God. Okay? There was ten of them. And they took their what? Their lamps. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Right? And he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but what? Shall have the light of life. Now listen, listen to this verbiage. I am the light of the world and follow. He that follows. So wait a second. I don't just get to be saved, John. I have to what? Follow. follow. Hold on. That means I got to do something? So that word follow means to accompany or be in the same way. 
Are we living for the Lord the way that he taught us to live for him? Are we in the same way accompanying the word of God? Are we following him? A disciple is a follower, a learner of Christ. I'm wrapping it up, y'all. Stick with me. A learner of Christ. Are we following after him? Why? Because they all, listen to me, they all had lamps. So they were all born again. They were all separated and holy and right with God. They all had lamps. They all had the light in them. This is where it gets. We already talked about you being the temple of the Holy Spirit and you're bought with a price. And then what did it say? They all went forth to meet the bridegroom. So they all started off the same way. They all got saved and they all had the light and they all were right and they all were like, I'm going to I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to meet Jesus. I'm going forward with Jesus. I'm going to have faith in Jesus. I'm going in there. They all started off the same way. But then there were five wise and five foolish. The wise were thoughtful about their relationship with the Lord. I want us to kind of gauge ourselves. Are we thoughtful about our relationship with the Lord? Do you think about him ever? Do I think about him ever? Because you know a lot of us have become, have become robots in the church. <laughs> We're just doing. That don't, that don't mean when I'm sitting down at home that I'm thinking about the Lord. He whose mind is stayed on him is found in perfect peace. Am I thoughtful about my, am I keeping him first? Is he first? Above everything in your life, is he first? Everything in my life. Am I keeping his character forefront of my mind, who he is? Am I allowing myself to be changed? Have we changed since we got saved? Okay, we, we changed for five years. Are we still changing? All right, all right, I changed for 10 years. Am I still changing? He said we're not going to be complete till the day of his coming. Am I still getting oil? Listen, you're not going to fill your car up once with gas and drive it for the rest of your life. And if you do, that is wonderful. <laughs> Let me know what gas station you go to. But really, you're not going to eat once and live off that for the rest of your life. I'll never forget this thing. It was talking about exercise, but it applies to this too. It was talking about if you were bought a brand new car and you were given it to at 16 when you get your license, and that was the only car you had to drive for the rest of your life, you could never get another car. How many oil changes would you get? Look, you know, we love to drive over the oil thing. We love to wait until it's right on the E and you got like one more mile to put gas in it. You ain't got to rotate my tires because that's too much money. Don't put another filter in. No more filter. You know they're good like that. This filter costs 80 bucks and this filter costs 100 bucks. No more filters. But if that was the only car you had to drive for the rest of your life, how will we actually take care of it? Y'all, we were given one car. You are the vessel of the Holy Spirit. You are the hands and the feet of Jesus. This is the only car you got. How are we taking care of it? Are we getting fresh oil? I don't know, now I might need an oil change. You know what I'm saying? God help us. Are we in continuing pursuit of Christ? says, but without faith it is possible to please him. For he that cometh to God must what? Believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Are you a diligent seeker? If you just come here, if we just come here Wednesdays and Sundays, you're not a diligent seeker. I'm sorry. Thank you, Selah. 
We're not. John, are we? We got to be seeking him what? Craving him always. Always. God, I, you ever, cra- look, have you ever got an itch in your tummy for some type of food? And you're like, I'm, look, I'm not, I got to get it. I got to get it. I got to have the cheesecake. I got to have the cake. I got to have the crawfish. Crawfish. I got to have jambalaya. I got to have the burger. I got to have the cheese fries. I got to have the steak. I got to have the shrimp. I got to have it. I'm getting it today. And you go get it. And you get your reward. But it's the same thing with the Lord. Are we like that with the Lord? Are we craving his presence? Are we diligently seeking him? Because he's a rewarder. Look, you're not just good. Look, some of us will drive an hour and 40 minutes just to get whatever that was. And then we can't even come across the tracks to get to church. In the rain. I don't have nothing to wear. I don't know how many people tell me that at the gym. I forgot my gym clothes today. Are you kidding me? Show up and, never mind. Really, though. Stop. Let's stop making excuses. I don't have time to pray. Well, when he comes back, then we're going to be there like this. I don't have time to read. Well, when he comes back, it's not by works, though. Because what is it by? It's by your faith driving you to seek the face of God, to seek the character of God, to seek the heart of God, to seek God for you and your family and your household. It's a look, because you can read and be like, check. But that's what the other, that's what the other virgins were doing. They were just doing it, not really to want to know the Lord. They were just doing it for their check. Went to church. Check. Oh, but I turned off that channel. Check. Didn't listen to that song. Check. I'm good. That's scary, y'all. That's a scary place to be because that's not about you wanting the heart of God or wanting to change. That's just about my checks. God help us. There was character, there was earmark, earmarks, excuse me, of the character of the wise. Let's see. Proverbs 1.5 says, a wise man will hear, be attentive, and will increase, be added to in what? Learning, instruction, and doctrine. And a man of understanding, discernment, shall attain what is wise counsel. So the wise will be attentive and increase in instruction and doctrine. Are we increasing in instruction and doctrine? And because I'm increasing, I will get what? Understanding and discernment. What I thought before, before like five years ago isn't the same way I think today. Because why? I got understanding and discernment. Because I did what? I sat under instruction. You get it? And what do I get from that? I get wise counsel. You ever sit with, everybody needs a counselor. The Bible is your greatest counselor. I'm not saying don't go to a counselor if you need it, okay? I believe in counsel. But what I'm saying is, is the Bible is your greatest instruction and your greatest counselor. Open it. What else is wise? Proverbs 3, 7, be not wise in thy own eyes. So lean not on your own understanding how you think it should be. Fear and respect, reverence the Lord, hold on, and depart from evil. Uh Uh-oh, what's wise? Departing from evil. That means lay it aside, decline it, remove it. If you know anything in your life is evil, 
lay it aside, decline it, remove it now. It's ruining your oil. It's ruining my oil. Listen, it can even be busyness. Busyness is, e is evil. Why? Because it takes away from my relationship with God. Anything that takes away from your, you better get balance. Ask the Lord for some balance. This isn't a condemning message. This is God saying, look, get your house in order. Get some things in order. When they got a little shaky, got a little out. But I'm here to say, we can get it in order, y'all. We can get it in order. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the disgrace and the promotions of fools. The wise shall inherit glory. All right, so five wise, five foolish. Foolish, what does foolish mean? Y'all ready for this? Dull, stupid, heedless, blockhead. Come on, if the pastor came up here and said, you blockhead, you're stupid. We'd be like, we never go into that church again. Could you believe what he said? Right, Selah. But the Bible is saying there were stupid blockheads. And they were heedless. That means they would not listen. They would not heed instruction. They were not willing to submit under the spirit of God and the word of God. They were not willing to yield. We talked about some of these things. Shatter, the, the scattering of the sheep. Our hearts being prone to wander and being led away. We see in Romans that there's none righteous, no, not one. None that seek after God. They're all gone on their own way, and they all become unprofitable. Why? They become useless. Because we're not continuing our relationship with the Lord through the blood and the blood alone. It says this, Matthew 25, 3, they were foolish, and they took their lamps and had no oil in them. So they had, they were born again, they had lamps, but no oil. They were in the church. They might have even been singing on the worship team. I, it might even be a pastor. No oil. Not getting any oil anywhere else. That's scary. And the wise took the oil in their vessels with their lamps. These foolish virgins were serving the Lord by law, church attendance, tithes, good deeds here and there, devotion here and there, serving the Lord through religious activity. Even meaning maybe in leadership, serving the Lord through position, seeking him for a word, but no longer seeking him for relationship. Beware. Beware. So what do we see? What do, Angela, this is like, okay, so what do I do? <laughs> I hear you. I want to be right with God. And he gives us instruction in Revelations. Y'all ready? Let's get back to the good part. Revelations, God is speaking to John through a vision, and he's speaking to the seven churches. Put up Revelations 2.1, if you will, Haley. God is speaking to the church of Ephesus, and he says this. Y'all ready? Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith the Lord. He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So there was what? Candlesticks. There was light in the church. God always recognizes the good in the church in every church he spoke to in Revelations. He always recognizes the good. And he says this in verse 2. I know thy works. I know thy labor. I know thy patience. I know you cannot bear evil. So those sound like marks of a wise person, right? Wise virgin. And he that has tried 
them which say they are apostles, and you found them to be liars. So what? They're able to recognize the truth in a lie. So they labored, they worked, they'd endured. They, they're able to recognize the truth in a lie. They're able to see these things. They depart from evil. Would that sound wise to you, Sabrina? Sounds pretty wise to me. But then he says, thou has borne patience and for thy name's sake has labored. So you labored and have not fainted. So you're still here, right? Still here. But then he says this. Revelation 2, 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. You have left. He didn't say lost. So the door's not shut yet. He didn't say you lost your first love. He said you left. And then he gives instructions. Revelations 2, 5, remember, that means recall, rehearse, exercise to your memory. Therefore, from whence you have fallen, where you were driven away from the course. Where were we driven away from the right course? And what? Repent. Turn around and do thy first works. How were you born again? You did what? Repented and believed. So what is thy return into thy first works? Repenting and what? Believe. What are we doing? Repenting and believing. Because what? We've left our first love. We see in the book of Romans, light rejected is light removed. The Christian can go on a downward spiral. Meaning, if, if God is pricking your heart and you reject it, if he's convicting you and we reject it, our heart becomes callous and we go more so in the opposite direction of what the Lord is telling us to do. Let's not do that. If God is calling us to repentance as a people today, that's what we need to do. I don't care how long we've lived for the Lord or how short we live for the Lord or what our ability and gifting. Your gift is not your oil. You ain't, we ain't making it in the door with our gift. Naya is not going to sing at the door and it's going to open. Even though her, her, her anointing has opened many doors in people's lives. I'm not going to preach to the door and it's going to open. The Lord could say to me, Angela, you preached in my name, but I never knew you. That means I wasn't sitting with him outside of this. I didn't know him in my everyday activity. I only do this 45 minutes. Jeff probably tell you I preach to him all the time, but I only do this. That means the rest of my lifestyle, what does it look like? Am I getting oil? Now, if you'd come up. Foolish virgins, they didn't stay on top of their relationship. They didn't tend to it. They didn't allow the Holy Spirit room for correction, repentance, and growth. So what happened? The bridegroom tarried, and they slumbered and slept. So I want to say this. Sometimes when I read that, I always like, oh, they were sleeping. <laughs> sleeping on a job. That wasn't, it was normal. It was like they were just living life. Because the, the wives were sleeping too, right? They were just living. You get what I'm saying? They weren't doing anything wrong at that time. They were, they were living. They slumbered and slept, and the mid, at midnight there was a cry, and behold, the bridegroom come, and they, listen, when he came, they all went out to meet him. Even the foolish. That actually woke me up inside. Because they were still thinking they were going. 
No, like, it would be like me and Sabrina waking up, and the bridegroom comes, and I slept over her house, and we both go out to meet him, and she goes, and I don't get to. I was like, okay, I still got time. (laughs) I still got time to get this right. I still got time. Right? Because Acts 1, 7 says, For he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times and the seasons which God has put into his power. So that means I have to live every day like it's like my last. Because I don't know when he's coming back. I don't know when my last day is. So he said, Behold, the bridegroom comes and what was the virgin's response all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps so they all got up and they all ran out and they all had their lamps and the foolish said unto the wise give us your oil our lamps have gone out they didn't have enough I want to say this because I know sometimes With a message like this, we can immediately go to works. Like, what more can I do, right, to be right with God? Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace, unmerited favor, you were saved through faith. That's right. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. That means that you can't do any more for God to get oil. You've got to what? Believe. Go back to faith and grace. Faith and grace. God, today, if y'all stand with me, today I wanna I wanna access your grace. I want to access your power. I want to access repentance. God, I want to change. Lord, I'm not sure if I have been coming to you through activity or God, I don't know, but Lord, I want more oil. I want more of your presence. I want more of your word. I want more instruction, more understanding, more discernment, God. God, I want more power. Lord, I want more oil. God, I need fresh oil. My oil is running low. God, I need more oil because why he he said but the wise answered and said it is not so lest there not be enough for us go and sell and get them from which buy yourselves and while they went to buy the bridegroom came and they went listen this was the title And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. It was too late. Those that were prepared were waiting for his coming, were examining their hearts. They were concerned with their character and their lives. They were attentive to the heart of the Father. They were desiring the glory and the kingdom of God to be revealed in their hearts. They were wanting a relationship. No matter what the cost, they were desiring more. And they went in. And afterwards, the virgin came. The other ones came. The foolish came and said, Lord, Lord, open up to us. And he answered and said, I know you not. Hear me. He said, I know you not. That meant they knew of him, but he didn't know them. How much do we come and we know of him, but does he know us? Are we we sitting with him enough to know us? Are we inquiring him enough to know us? Are we laying things down at his feet that he know us? Listen, he can't fill you with oil if you got all this stuff in you and you're not willing to give it to him. Empty your vessel so he could fill it. So I want to ask us this. Do we know if we're ready? Do we want to be ready? 
There's two ways we can do this. We can come to the altar and repent and say, God, I, I, I've been doing this wrong. I've been doing it through works. Lord, and I, I just want to get it right with you. And I repent and I return to my first love and forgive me and wash me. And I want to be right. I want oil today, oh God. Or we can say, God, I've been being wise, Lord, and I just, I just need more oil. <laughs> more oil. But I want to pretty much guarantee we all got something to get right about. So as Naya plays, as the band plays, I invite you right here to this place to take a step out. See, that's oil. Faith is oil. God, I'm going to take a step out, and I'm going to say, Lord, touch me. I need oil. I need oil. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. I need your spirit to move today. In Jesus' name. <laughs> 